Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Ten Mile River Scout Museum presents a program of virtual talks. Since COVID and the museum not being able to be open, we've uh, reached out to a number of knowledgeable and expert people in, on a variety of subjects and material, and we've been offering this series of free webinars, and I'm really glad you could be here to join us tonight. The Ten Mile River Scout Museum is located at the Ten Mile River Scout Camps Reservation, which is a 12,000 acre reservation in Narrowsburg, New York. The reservation was started in 1927 with the acquisition of lands led by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The Ten Mile River Scout Museum was started in 1997 and it's dedicated to preserving the history and artifacts of the Ten Mile River Scout Camps and the local area. As I said, the museum is closed due to COVID, but you can actually take a virtual tour of the museum at our website, tmrmuseum.org. Tonight's webinar is being presented on the platform GoToWebinar. And somewhere on your screen, you'll see a box that looks something like this with an area marked questions. If during the course of the presentation, you have questions for our presenter, feel free to type them into the question box and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. Also at the end of tonight's program, if you could stick around and take a brief survey, we would greatly appreciate that. The video recording of this whole program will be available on the museum's YouTube channel in about three days. Here are the various ways you can interact with the museum on social media. There's our website, tmrmuseum.org, our Facebook page, our Twitter account, and on YouTube, you can search for the Ten Mile River Scout Museum. If you have any questions, you can call the museum. You can email questions at tmrmuseum.org. And if you want to get in touch with me directly, you can email chairman at tmrmuseum.org. These programs are presented free to the public. It does cost the museum something to do this. And if you're so inclined and you care to support the museum's uh, webinars and other work, feel free to go to tmrmuseum.org slash donate and make some kind of contribution, we greatly appreciate those. It's uh, the, the Catskills, uh, where Ten Mile River is part of the greater, Cat, the greater Catskills, uh, is world renowned for its streams, its trout, and fly fishing. Uh, Deddies in Livingston Manor is a is a uh, institution in the fly fishing world and has an international reputation. And we are very fortunate this evening to have Kelly Buckta, who with her partner, Joe Fox, are the current co-owners of Getty's Flies. Uh, as I said, it's located in Livingston Manor. And Kelly's talk will cover the basics of fly fishing, conservation ethics, and the historical nature of fly fishing in the Catskills. So it's with great pleasure that I present Kelly Bukta. Thank you, Michael. Going to get my screen ready to go. And hopefully everyone can see my screen. Am I good? Not yet. I see you, you really well. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is, I'm trying to get my main screen. I'm clicking show, but I'm not seeing anything. Am I a presenter? Show my screen. Here we go. Oh, there you go. We got it. Okay. So let's get uh, that there. I'm just grabbing, you see me in my desktop, I'm just grabbing the presentation. So hopefully it's there now, are we good? Yes, you're golden. 
Beautiful. Welcome. Thank you for that introduction, Michael, and sorry for that technical difficulties. Welcome. Um, my name is, as Michael said, I'm Kelly Bakta. I am the fourth generation uh, co-owner with my partner, Joe Fox. Uh, I consider myself a conservationist and angler turned a former, uh, turned a fly shop co-owner. I'm a former teacher. I taught for 20 years in the public school systems, English, and I have a passion for fly fishing and fly tying, but I am not a licensed guide. I repeat, I am not a licensed guide. Uh, New York has plenty of awesome licensed guides, but that's just not me. Uh, my goal tonight is to provide an overview of fly fishing and some stewardship of the lands that we're on and the beauty and the heritage of it and provide a starting point for new anglers. All right, a little bit about the shop. As Michael said, um, we're just beat, uh, we're one year younger than the 12,000 acres uh, that the 10 Mile River Museum and the preserve sits on. Uh, we currently take the title as the oldest family run fly shop, meaning there are some older fishing stores out there um, that sell bait and tackle, but exclusively fly fishing. Uh, we believe internationally, at least within the US, that we are the oldest. Uh, we're celebrating our 93rd years in, uh, years in business. Uh, originally, the fly shop was located in Roscoe, New York. It moved to Livingston Manor four years ago. Uh, Walt and Winnie Daddy were the first generation of Catskill style uh, flies and fly tires, along with Harry and Elsie Darby, Dean Rod Hendrickson, some many, many big names in there, and I know I missed a few. Uh, Mary Daddy, their daughter, um, was the second generation who carried on the business. It skipped her children's generation and it fell to her grandson, Joe Fox, who took it up as the fourth generation. All our flies, as for the past 93 years, are continued to be tied in-house and by a group of local tires. Let's talk a little bit about stewardship because this is what I believe makes fly fishing extremely unique. Um, it's what gives us, as anglers, um, an ability to access different spots of the river, opposed to some conventional terminal tackle fishing. Um, and a few things as a reminder, wherever you're fishing, whether it's in New York State or it's in Virginia or it's in out west in Montana, always purchase a license where you plan to fish. That's proper stewardship and environmental and conservation ethics, aside from the fact that it is required of all anglers. All the monies for licensing goes towards conservation and fishery management. Some states have a larger percentage than others. And fishing licenses have uh, a three to five day or a month or a year. They all have different dates. All states have free fishing days. You could look for those at takemefishing.org. And you could easily buy a license in person at many locations, but you could also get them online, which is fantastic in terms of our mobility and cell phones and the technology that we use today. In New York, our public fishing rights are known as PFR, um, and those are access that is dedicated, that private landowners have deeded um, a path or a footway to the river that people can use for fishing. It's not for kayaking, it's not for boating, it's just for fishing, there are the public fishing rights. And know the regulations, that's important with stewardship. Know where you are, know the difference between waters that are catch and release, waters where you can harvest the legal limit of fish, you could take fish, and practice fishing etiquette. Um, and that's something that we see as more people are getting outside, we're seeing a diminishing of that. And we feel as our job as the shop is to try to promote that as best we can and to practice conservation ethics. And know that some days are better than others, just like in life, same thing on the water when you're fly fishing. Be open to all the experiences, both good and bad, and seek to share information with others. So why would one fly fish? Uh, trout live in beautiful places, and that's probably I would say up in the Catskills, 98% of the species that people fly fish for, but nationally and internationally, you can catch a rooster fish on a fly rod, you can catch a perch, you can catch a muskie, you can catch tuna, you can even catch a shark on a fly rod, which sounds crazy, but saltwater fly fishing is also another hobby and passion. Not of mine, but maybe of somebody else's on here. Uh, fly fishing is called fly fishing because it involves casting a fly line with an artificial lure. Um, that artificial lure is made of feathers and furs. It has uh, been around since the 1500s. Um, it is artificial. It is not using bait or a bug. Um, it's an imitation. And for all of us anglers on the water, it involves an observation of the water and the air conditions, uh, the aquatic insects, the environment that you're around. You are literally immersed in the water, in the river, or a pond or a lake, wherever you might be fly fishing, but mostly in a river. And you're taking a look at that beautiful place. You're taking a look and you're reflective and you're watching everything around you. And above all, it should be fun. 
So some stats on fly fishing, because it, since the pandemic, it has become a large population uh, that has seen an increase in the sport and activity, as well as hiking and camping. Because particularly with the, with the pandemic, people want to be outside. They want to feel rooted to the terra firma, to the ground around them. Um, that's a wonderful thing to bring people into the area and outside and supporting national and state and local parks. However, that fast growing population also comes with some um, negatives about trash and about cleanup and about leaving no trace and trying to keep the areas protected. Uh, there's currently 7 million fly anglers, and this is from the takemefishing.org special report that's uh, sponsored in, by the Recreation, Boating, and Fishing Foundation, RBFF. Um, what I find interesting is that all ages fly fish, whether you're between 16 and 17 or 45 and up. Um, and that's a great to see that there is a new perception of the sport, that it's just not an old person sport. And I use that term loosely because that's what's been depicted in paintings from the Hudson River area and all the way through, that there's new attitudes, there's new opportunity to be hooked. And that was a total pun. So why fly fish in the Catskill? Um, and as, Mitch, as uh, Michael said, uh, internationally known uh, for some, some people might argue it's the Poconos, but it's the birthplace of American dry fly fishing, where Theodore Gordon first cast the line on the Never Sink in the Beaver Kill with a dry fly. We Catskills have their unique style of dry flies, and that's one picture. That's a Quill Gordon, named after Theodore Gordon. And there's a whole heritage of Catskill fly tires that to this day are still emulated and learned and revered throughout the world. You also have, aside from the people, you have the heritage streams in the area. You have the Never Sink, the Beaverkill, the Willow Weemock, the Esopus and the Northern Catskills. You have the Delaware River, uh, the Main Stem, the West Branch, the East Branch, and all the small creeks and trips. These are beautiful, pristine places. These are the wild Catskills that people have come to love, that they've searched out for centuries. Uh, to come and find respite and relaxation. It's give or take a two mile radius from New York City, so it makes sense for people to seek out solitude in nature. There is a ton of public access throughout the region. It's geographically suited for fishing in all seasons and conditions, so I wouldn't recommend fishing in three feet of snow and having ice on your guides. And there's also a fly fishing center and museum located in Livingston Manor that gives you a lot more history than I just encapsulated in one slide. So we'll talk a little bit about the Catskill Park um, in the forest preserve that's here. Um, the museum doesn't lie within Catskill Park. It's a little bit outside of it, but as you can see, the little blue lines in the green areas, there's a lot of uh, forests and preserves. And this map comes from the DEC in New York. That is that special place that's there. Um, and you can see the little blue star that denotes it as well. The Catskill Park and Forest Preserve are two different places. Um, the wilderness is about 143,000 acres and they're accessible by foot and only. Um, the wild forest has 130,000 acres that give you a little bit more recreation. There can be biking in there and each of the areas of state forest and wild forest have different restrictions. And then you have the state recreation areas where there's about 6,000 acres that includes Bel Air and campgrounds and day use areas that sometimes have a fee or permit, but most of them are open and, and available for people to enjoy, go out and enjoy. Uh, the park is made up of public and private land. Um, that the public land is open, the private land of course is private, and the forest preserve is state land dedicated for recreation. And again, those, uh, there are different variances in the properties, but it's a wonderful thing to go out and explore. And that's a lot of acres that has been saved and protected and preserved by many environmentalists, people who love the nature and the world around them and want to see it continue to be open and wild and free space. This is a hot topic for politicians and for families and people local in the area, water, there's all sorts of things that come into play. But again, somehow the, the resilience of the Catskill people in the area seems to pers persevere throughout uh, many obstacles. So let's talk about getting out and fishing. And I believe that's a shot of the downstream of the Will Weemock River in full bloom. Um, our trees aren't there yet, but we're getting there. So we'll talk a little bit about fly fishing basics. And if those that are watching are more seasoned to fly fishing, this is a brief and basic overview. Um, but it's always good to start somewhere and just refresh ourselves with some basic knowledge. Fly rods um, are come in bamboo, fiberglass, and graphite. And that's what cast your fly line. The ranges vary. The most popular tends to be a nine foot five weight. 
bras are weighted by feet and by weight, but also 864 weights are pretty, uh, pretty popular too for the region, as well as rods can go up to 10 feet plus, especially when you get into salt water and the weight, the heft of the rod. A fly reel balances out the rod and it holds the line, the leader and tippet and what's casted in the water. Your fly line is a PVC coated nylon core line. Um, standard is usually four to six weight, but that's what you cast out to fly fish and to get the fly, which is extremely lightweight, um, out to the targeted fish. And then you have your leaders and tippet, which is some basic gear that helps connect the line to the leader, to the tippet, to the fly to get you on the water. And that's your direct contact. Some basic gear, whether it's waders, um, boots, those are the popular things to get you in the river. Um, breathable neoprene chest and hip style, um, boots, felt soles, rubber soles, storage from vest to lanyards to fanny packs and sling packs, a net, whether it's mesh or rubber or wood or bamboo or metal, and fly boxes. Those are the things that would simply get you out on the water. And this is a great time to be out. Most people think a barrier to fly fishing is that the gear is so expensive, and it is. I'm not going to lie, there's gear that's in the $1,000 range, but there's also affordable setups in the $100 to $200 range. Given where we are in materials and items that are available, um, this is a great opportunity to get on the water. Um, whether it's used gear or it's through cooperatives, there's so much um, gear out there that is available. Sometimes you have to look a little harder to find it, but it is there and that availability is awesome. I like to equate it to cable TV in the early 80s or cell phones when they first came out, but they were just for the few, the privileged. But as the technology and the demand increased, the production was able to bring more, more of the technology to a larger amount of people. And that's where we are today. When you're also fishing and you're out there, you have to remember that you're not alone. Um, that is my shoe uh, and a large bear print. Um, and that's something to take a look at um, because there's natural nature all around us. There's more than just the rivers and the fish. There's birds, there's bears, there's frogs. There's all sorts of things that are out there. Um, you always want to remember to wear a hat. It also uh, it will help you when you're casting in an errant cast so it doesn't catch your face or your ear. And it will also provide sun protection and cut down on the glare. Buffs and neck gaiters have been popular in a pandemic as masks, but they also provide sun and bug protection. Sunglasses offer your eyes and also give you a shield as a safety feature. Uh, water bottles to be hydrated. A whistle for sound over running water, especially if you venture out on your own. You want to make sure you have a whistle because it's hard to yell over running water. A whistle is a very distinct sound that usually alerts someone who hears it that somebody needs help. In your car or with you, you could always have extra clothes and first aid kits, bug spray and bear spray. Um, and some people carry a waiting staff with them, which could be a stick or it could be an actual waiting staff or an old ski pole for extra security when they're walking on the water and land. But wait, there's more. This is why sometimes people get discouraged with fly fishing and panic because they think they need to have everything. We covered the basics that will get you on the water safely and adequately to enjoy your time out there. But there's a few other things that I think are important to mention. I'm a big fan of a thermometer. Um, water temperature is important. Um, depending on what species you're targeting, you wanna make sure that you monitor the water temperature, particularly trout or cold water species. If the water is above 68 degrees, it's fatal for them. Um, they need cold water to thrive. They need clean, cold water. Um, if you're looking at a sunfish or a panfish, those are warm water species, bass, they're gonna love water. So when the rivers heat up, a lot of fly fishing anglers will switch species. And I think it's important to carry the thermometer just as to know the conditions that you're fishing in just as well as you would carry a rain jacket in case it was raining. You have forceps, which are pliers um, that you could use to tie your fly to your tippet, but they also aid in removing the hook from the fish's mouth if you choose to uh, catch and release the fish. It makes it a little easier. Um, nippers are fancy name for um, uh, nail clippers, and those are used to cut your leader and tippet when you're changing your flies. And then you have float in, which keeps your flies floating on the surface. It's a silicone dressing. Um, and you have some weight. Lead free is the best option, tungsten or tin or aluminum, opposed to the lead um, to keep the flies weighted down in the water column while you're fishing. And then there's a few other items that people like to have with them. 
fly casting is the main component of fly fishing. Aside from the fly, you can't get that weightless item out there unless you're casting. Where a spin rod has a heavy lure and it's just a flick of the wrist to get it out there in the water where you want it based on moving your body. Casting is what propels the fly on the water into the target. Um, you have to utilize your casting techniques and methods to get that fly out there where you want it in the stream and the river. And there's several styles of casting and methods, but the three that are fairly similar throughout is the overhead cast where the back cast lifts the line off the water and the forward cast brings it back. That's often what people call 10 and two. You bring your rod forward, backwards, and you bring it forward. The side cast is the same as the overhead, except you're using it in a side motion. And the roll cast is when the line is on the water, you tie everything on, you let it lay on the water, and then you lift it up slightly and you roll it back in a forward motion. Um, casting is an art, it's a skill, it takes a lot of practice. Um, you could cast on grass, you could cast on water. Don't recommend casting on pavement or, or concrete because it will dull and damage the coating on the fly line. But movies like A River Runs Fluid have made casting look to be dramatic and dreamy. And it is when you get that perfect cast and everything works well and there's no wind. Uh, that doesn't happen a lot. Um, for some people it does, for most it doesn't because conditions are ch constantly changing. So sometimes the wind takes your line and it lands somewhere different and you see the fish come up, but that's sort of the joy of it. Mending the line repositions the fly line on the surface and helps keep it uh, drift free so that that piece of feathers and fur that's tied together looks like it's a fly on top of the water. It looks like a just hatched aquatic insect. Or if it's a nymph or a streamer, it's low on the bottom of the river on the sandy bottom, kicking up with rocks so that it imitates that bug that's just in the nympho, just starting out their phase. Flies, we talked a lot about, I uh, talked a lot about flies and what they are. That's an aquatic insect, that's an isonychia, it's a mayfly. Um, flies are what fish eat. Um, bugs are what fish eat. They are natural predators. They need to survive by eating um, and they don't have Uber delivering food to them. Um, if they don't have people throwing worms and fishing, that's another source of substance. They have to eat what's in around them. The Catskills have an overly abundance of aquatic insects. We have the right amount of river bottom and rock and sand and silt for a, a ton of abundance of flies to hatch, particularly mayflies. Uh, aquatic insects can be very small. They can be very large. Minnows, crayfish, leeches, they're not uh, insects per se, um, but they are different animals and different species um, and different critters that fish trout particularly love. Flies come in a variety of sizes and patterns that represent the different stages of insect development and they correlate with the season. Right now, we are eagerly awaiting the main stems to see the Hendrickson's and so there are some of the flies and the blue quills that start coming out to certain subspecies of aquatic insects that will eventually make their way through the whole river system. What's unique about flies is they could be used in all water conditions. You have dry flies that are stay on the top surface of the, of the river and you put your floating on them to keep them on top. And for a fish who's looking up, they see that meal and they'll come up and take it. And that's what we see pictures and most depictions of. But in the middle of the water column, you could use a nymph, you could use a streamer, you could use a type of wet fly, or you could even go to the bottom and bounce the fly right on the bottom of the river. You might get caught up in rocks and trees and some other things, root wads and things there. But reading the water is key to knowing where the fish are feeding. Because you're standing in the river, but fish can be on top, they could be in the middle, they could be on the bottom. They can move to your left and right. They are always the moving target that you're looking to cast towards. Flies are mostly composed with feathers and fur and thread and tinsel and wire and synthetic materials, foam, beads. There's pretty much not anything that you could tie a fly with. You could use electrical wire, you could use tape, you know, uh, scotch tape or even a Band-Aid coil to make a rib. Uh, that's where the fun and the creativity of fly tying comes in. That's personally my favorite. I love to tie flies more than I like to be out in the water fishing, um, but there is a creativity to that. And flies, this is a really basic mayfly etymology by David Kyle, um, and this is of mayflies. And you can see the nymph on the very bottom. It looks like a kind of crawly thing. And then it starts to emerge because it's getting its shuck and it's starting to come up. And then it gets to the surface as it's done. Um, and it's a fully fledged mayfly. And these are bugs that have literally sometimes a day or two, maybe three days of a lifespan or even shorter. 
and then it moves to lay its eggs, drop them back down in the water, and then they die. They don't have very long lives. They're basically hatching to procreate and then to leave for the next generation. And flies are uh, all are tied in different patterns to mimic these different stages of the etymology, and the trout are certainly in tune with them up here. So when you're filling your fly box, um, the top photo is a bass popper made with some rubber legs and foam and deer hair. The middle photo with the blue are nymphs and jigs. Those are the mints, the very early stages of a bug. The head is supposed to be, is supposed to be representing the head, um, and maybe the body is the case. And then you have another cat scale dry fly that's a um, and you have the body and the tail as it sits on the surface. Your nymphs float near the bottom and then or the middle of the water column, and they resemble that early stage. Streamers resemble bait fish. They could resemble nothing. They could just be something flashy to catch someone's face. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to fool the fish to take fly so that you could catch it, right? Um, and then streamers float near the middle or the bottom of the water column. Your wet flies resemble an emerging insect, and they're in the middle of the water column. And your dry flies float on your top, and they resemble that insect that's on top of the water. So barriers to fishing. Um, why some people find fly fishing to be intimidating is because it's expensive. Uh, they don't know where to go. They don't know what flies to use. They don't have enough time um, because you need family and work and different responsibilities to get out the water. You could fish fantastically for an hour, but two to three hours gives you enough time to get yourself antiquated with the, where you are and your conditions and surroundings and gives you a nice day. People also say that there's barriers to fly fishing is not having any instruction or mentoring, but it's too, learn, too hard to learn, it's overwhelming. And they say they have no one to fish with. They're afraid to go by themselves or they wanna be with a group. And given the times that we're in, some people are either in love with one being by themselves solitary or they're missing a group or the other. And all these barriers are real. I'm not gonna deny that these things are not true because they are true. For some people, the expense is that way, or the time is that way, or not knowing where to go. They could be in a landlocked area where they just have ponds, and the ponds are in golf courses or in gated areas where they don't have access to. But anywhere that you could find legal access to a water, there's going to be a fish there. I would be so surprised if it wasn't, whether it's a sunfish, or it's a perch, or it's a trout, or it's, um, uh, it's a large mouth or a small mouth bass bass, you're going to see fish somewhere. Um, and you just have to try to take those barriers down to the best of your capability so that you can make time and learn a new hobby. And that's my dad holding a nice little rainbow. Um, I always include him in presentations if he's watching. Hi, dad. <laughs> so how to learn? So how do you get over these barriers? Um, I wish we could snap our fingers and have things happen for us, but that's not the case. If you're fortunate to live in the Catskills or travel to the Catskills or have a friend or a relative that has a second home up here where you have access to stay and explore, you have to start researching. Um, books and magazines and internet is all at our fingertips, whether it's our phone or iPad or a computer. YouTube has tons of videos. If you're in the podcast and virtual seminars like this one, this is how you start learning. You start going into research mode, you take a couple notes, and you start investigating. You start scouting and looking for observations. You look at the air temperature. You start looking at what's around you, the buds and the flowers and the leaves and the trees, the flora. That's a big indicator of what's happening. The fauna, um, and there's a typo there, yikes, of the birds and rising fish. Um, when you start seeing some action, you know that the weather and the springtime is heating up and the water conditions. Ask a friend who fishes. I'm sure you know somebody who fishes, whether it's fly fishing or conventional terminal fishing. Join in their trip. They might have some extra gear to share. And I could almost guarantee 100% that if someone fishes and you ask if you could tag along, anglers, love telling stories. They love sharing their passion. They would be elated to, get, to bring you with them. And once you get into research mode, you want to get going and you want to find support. Um, the best way to find support, aside from doing things on your own and with the internet, is to visit a fly shop. Um, you get the best advice. The staff that work there, they love to fish. They know the water. They know the land. They have that needed intel on all the local conditions. And you're also supporting a small business. I would be negligent if I didn't say that. Um, these are people much like if you were going to a bicycle shop. Their expertise is there because they're fishing anywhere from 100 to 200 days a year. 
Um, you could hire a fishing guide. If you don't want to visit a shop or you feel intimidated, you could hire a fishing guide. In New York, they are licensed, they are insured, and they're knowledgeable. It's a service they're providing to you to take you on the water, to help guide you and teach you, and you get that intimate connection with them and with the water in the area. You could also join a fishing organization to build your network so that you're not by yourself. Um, and I named several fishing organizations um, that I absolutely adore. They all do great things. Um, they all are looking at conservation. They're all looking at protecting and preserving land and public land. Um, and they all have New York chapters, um, whether you're upstate or downstate. Backcountry Hunters and Anglers has a New York chapter. There's uh, Brown Folks Fishing. There's the Fly Fishers International, uh, the Theodore Gordon Fly Fishers, Latino Outdoors, um, the Metropolitan Fly Fishers in New York, in Trout Unlimited, um, which is the nation's largest cold water conservation organization uh, dedicated to restoring and protecting and reconnecting habitat. And that's a lovely little uh, fish caught on one of the rivers here in a net there hanging out. And with gratitude, um, I feel like I ran through a lot of information and I hope there's some question or somebody on the seminar um, that would love to share a fish story with us. Um, you could reach me personally at kelly at deadyflies.com. You could find us at www.deadyflies.com. And if there's anything that I could do to help you get on the water, to ease your experiences, or to provide you with some other information that I didn't get to cover today, um, please let me know. So at this point, it's 730. Um, we still have about 20 minutes or so, half hour for questions and stories. Um, we could easily share some. Um, because this is a beautiful area and I'm sure if you're watching you have an interest or you've seen something or you've driven by one of the rivers and uh, we'll open up to the floor. So I'm going to give it back to you Mitchell and we'll go from there. Thank you Kelly. This was really really fantastic and very interesting and obviously of course we appreciate your time. So let's hit some questions. Do you have any preference of any particular area in the Catskills to fly fish? Oh that's a great question. I love them all. I think it depends, I want to say for me, the time of the year. Um, if you're trout fishing, you want to stay in that cool water. Uh, so you want to find cold water and that's what's great that any time of the year, you could definitely find a river to fish. Uh, I tend to be a homebody uh, even before the pandemic and the Willow Weemock is in the, my backyard, uh, well through the woods a little bit. So I like the Willow Weemock. Um, I like the Esopus. It's a challenging river for me to wade because I have some back issues that makes it tough, but I think that's a great river too. I love the Beaver Kill um, and uh, the Delaware. You can't beat that. That's big, big water for us here. So you can find little rivers in between uh, for native brook trout that are, that are absolutely gems of, of a fish that many people don't often go for. You could hike in or you could find a spot where you could access um, and walk maybe 10 feet from your car and be in the river. Great. Um, here's a question that everybody always loves to find out. What was the biggest catch? <laughs> the biggest catch uh, for me was on the East Branch was a, rain was a rainbow, a Delaware rainbow. And it was just about 21 to 22 inches. Um, I didn't catch the fish. I hooked it. It jumped in the air a couple of times. And I was so excited when I saw the size that I pinged person I was fishing with, uh, the line hit the net and the fish had a very natural catch and release. So it kind of literally, the hook popped out of its mouth and it did a free willy shamu leap to show me how big it was and then went right back into the river. But I still consider it a catch because I was able to have it on the line for eight seconds or more. So playing by the rodeo rules, that was a fish. <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, that's great. Um, what time of day do you think is the best time to fish? It's seasonal. Um, so right now, I would prefer to fish in the afternoon. I would probably be going out anytime between the hours of two and seven to see if there's uh, it's a little cooler side, but it's a better chance for some aquatic insects to be hatching. If we were fishing in June, I would say anytime between 7.30, 8 o'clock a.m. and all the way till dark, 9 o'clock is great to fish. If I was fishing in August when the water is pretty warm, I would probably try to get out there as early as I can before the water temperature heated up. But if I was fishing for warm water fish, I don't think a time of day matters. Um, and I will have Great. to say, it's not always about the big fish. For me, the small brook trout um, in the blue lines up in the Catskill Park, um, taking a hike from uh, the Willow Weemock State Forest and going in and finding four or five inch fish 
um, that are super tiny and super sweet and just beautiful colors, reds and blues and yellows um, and olives. Um, those are my favorite fish. Uh, they're small, they're fragile. They are the harbingers of the great environment that we live in and it shows that it's protected and preserved. So those are my favorite fish, but nobody wants to hear about a four inch fish. <laughs> well, it's, it's fine too. Um, can you fly fish from the shore or do you have to wade out into the water? It's very hard to fly fish from the shore because you need room for a cast. And if you're standing by the shore, there's trees and there's shrubbery and there could be other obstacles for your area there. However, um, definitely standing in the river is the best way to fly fish. And if you are fortunate enough to be on a drift boat in the Delaware, you could definitely be on a boat um, drifting or a rowboat, a kayak, a canoe. I've seen people fly fish from in different areas, but you definitely want that immersible part in the water. Interesting. Um, do you think it is better to fish in a small group or alone as opposed to a large group, which might scare off the fish? <laughs> large groups, uh, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, I prefer to fish sometimes by myself if I want that moment of solitude and reflection and, and work at my own pace and go up and down a river and not have to worry about others. But usually I tend to fish with no more than two, two or three people, maybe four, including myself. I find that if we hit a spot and there's no cars there, like we could park and we could spread out um, because water and sound, uh, sound carries over water. I'm not yelling on the river. I might hoot if I have a fish on or something. Um, or to find each other, but most of us spread out and tend to fish by ourselves or within, I just, you know, within a good, you know, we're seeable distance from each other. Uh, large groups of 12 or 14, you don't find that in the fly fishing world. Um, that's more of maybe uh, surf casting or, do, or other types of fishing. If you're in a pond or in a lake, um, you mostly find that solitude and that quietude in fly fishing. Interesting. So there are a lot of options. Uh, Really, really Definitely. interesting stuff. Look forward to trying it sometime this summer. It's been a long time since I've done any fishing, but definitely want to try it again. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. But before I do that, to wrap it up, if anybody has any questions that you think of tomorrow or in the next couple of days or after you get the presentation via YouTube, just feel free to email us, email us and we'll help you out with an answer because we want to make sure um, everything is uh, taken care of. And we have one yeah. more question that just flew in as I was chatting. So what's the best tasting type of trout? Ooh, um, I have to say, I don't know because I practice catch and release. So all my fish go back. Um, I, don't, I don't take or harvest any of the fish and uh, I'm not a fish eater by just by nature. So even on a menu, I know that uh, beaver tail hatchery in the area here has fish, uh, rainbow trout people tend to like and see on the menu as well. Um, but I can't, I can't quite answer that. But before I get turned over to uh, Michael and Mitchell, uh, the work that they do at the 10 mile river is about educating and preserving and getting people outdoors. And I love that. Um, we're living in a time now more than ever that we wanna feel connected to each other. We wanna feel connected to our world around us. And I think, you know, my parting words would be whether it's fly fishing or it's spin fishing or it's, or it's a worm, just getting out there. It's a family activity. Um, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't because my dad wanted to get me outside. He wanted us away from video games and the computer. He wanted us outside and experiencing what the world was around us. He wanted us to see what was there. And that, that's an important thing. And whether it's fly fishing or any type of fishing, getting yourself out there, camping, hiking, utilizing those natural resources that we have. And we're so fortunate living in the Catskills to have these beautiful places right in our backyard and right around us and to share them with people. And as the world opens up more, I, I encourage everyone to do that and to be an ambassador for the outdoors and to be an ambassador for fresh air and sunshine on your face and your feet on the ground and uh, enjoying yourself. I agree with that 100% and wish more people were doing <laughs> all of this. And on that note, like I said, if you have any other questions that come up in the next couple of days, feel free to email at us. Email us. And now I am going to turn it back over to Mike Drillinger to wrap it up.
Great. Um, thank you, Kelly, so much. I, I, I appreciate uh, your time and I share your passion for the outdoors and, and for nature. And I'm glad that we made this connection. Um, I, I hope we get a chance to interact some more. Um, I hope those of you who saw Kelly's presentation uh, have had so, had your curiosity sparked. Um, our co-summer director, Glenn Pontier, uh, in one of his incarnations, was the director of the Fly Fishing Museum, which Kelly mentioned earlier. I hope you get a chance to, to visit that, as well as visiting Deddy's and saying hello to Kelly while you're there. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> And the webinar series continues on May 4th at 7 p.m. One of our um, trustees at the Timla River Scout Museum, Bill Mulrennan, will be talking about patch collecting. So uh, if you are a patch collector, Bill will be talking about the patches of Timla River Scout Camp as well as the Order of the Arrow. I hope you will, uh, you'll join us then on May 4th. I want to remind all of you that if you have never visited the Ten Mile River Scout Museum, uh, even though the museum is not currently open because of COVID, you can take a virtual tour if you go to the museum website. And uh, Scouts had the opportunity last year to earn the 2020 Historian Award uh, by taking the virtual tour and I'm pretty certain that we'll have a 2021 uh, award, historian award that scouts who can't actually make it to the museum will be able to earn online. The museum also came up with, and we're offering this six inch commemorative backpack, which you can purchase at the uh, museum online store at tmrmuseum.org. Uh, it's got the no COVID logo on there to commemorate this very unusual year that we all just lived through. Scouts can earn the 10 Mile River Historical Trails Award. You know the uh, 10 Mile River Trail is uh, 32 miles around the, um, the inside border of the 10 Mile River Scout Camp Reservation. Uh, you can earn the basic award by hiking 10 miles and then there's a 14 mile or 13 mile or uh, 14 mile or 30 mile or and 50 mile or device that you can get. And you can learn more information about the Historical Trail Award at the museum's website. Uh, I had said earlier, and I'll say again, if you enjoyed this program and want to help support programs like it in the future, you might want to consider making a donation to the museum. And here again at the bottom of the screen, I list all of the ways that you can interact with the museum on social media. And that's it for tonight's program. Again, thanks, Kelly. Thank you all for joining us. And everybody have a good night. <laughs>